some people are going to say they're night owls and they get their wind in the evening where they can focus and the world just got quiet and that works for them. For me, I consider myself like a car that needs warming up. So if I'm going to start the day at eight o'clock, my first deep work isn't till 8.30 or nine o'clock. Hey, it's the Profit Answer Man, Rocky Lalvani. If you're new to the podcast, check out my interview with Mike Michalowicz. It's episode number two. If you want to hear about each chapter in the Profit First book, go back and listen to episodes three through 13. Episode one is the why and how. On the Profit Answer Man, we learn money mastery without all the complicated accounting mumbo jumbo using a simple system. Your accountant is busy documenting your transactions and creating a rearview mirror of what happened. My guess is you don't even look at the reports they sent you. If you're like most business owners, you struggle with this. And it's not your fault. We aren't taught money in school. And accountants aren't taught how to be profitable. The Profit First system created by Mike Michalowicz works, and he certified me to help you implement the system in your business. Remember, the new equation is sales minus profit equals expenses. Let's face it, without cash flow, you can't pay your employees, buy needed materials, or pay your mortgage and support your family. I help you to do that and more, so you can focus on the parts of the business you love and receive the rewards for your labor and investment into your business. The stronger you are as a business owner, the more jobs you create, the better we are as a country. Small business owners are the backbone of America, and for that, you deserve to be well rewarded. Just remember, more revenue does not equal more profit. That's why we focus on the bottom line. My second favorite subject is system building, which creates massive productivity and drives more cash and profit, my favorite subject. It also means you're not the center of your business. It can run without you. How nice is that? Today, we have another Profit First success story along with how to be more productivity. Amber De La Garza is the productivity specialist. She's got more than a decade helping small business owners like you maximize profits, reduce stress, and make more time for what matters most by improving their time management and increasing their productivity. She's a coach, trainer, speaker, and host of the Productivity Straight Talk podcast and creator of Leverage Lab. She loves sharing her message and helping people like you have a more productive, easier-to-run business. Let's meet Amber. Welcome to the Profit Answer Man, Amber De La Garza. It's great to have you join us today. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to our chat. And I'm excited to learn from you. Can you tell us a little about yourself and your business? Yeah. So I am a productivity and time management coach for small business owners. I have been in business since 2012, specializing in helping business owners make time for what matters most, increase their profits and decrease their stress. So lots of things that they want most, right? We all want less stress, more profits. And I do that through one-on-one -on -one coaching as well as group coaching and my podcast. Nice. I, I love product. Like I'm a systems guy. And it's funny because originally I was like, I get too many emails. So how do I get rid of some? And you try and unsubscribe and they don't listen to you, right? They just keep coming. Right. And then I was like, I'm going to hire a VA to deal with this because I didn't want to deal with it. And then I started looking at my emails. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm going to pay somebody all that money to look at garbage? Mm. Like, this is not going to work. And so I kept looking and I finally found a solution. I don't know if you're familiar with SaneBox. I have heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so SaneBox solved my problems for like, I don't know, 60 bucks a year. And in the beginning, I had this email withdrawal. Okay. And then now I have email oblivious. Like, I don't even care about emails anymore because 
I don't get them anywhere near as much. Like mm-hmm. I don't get in the top of my mailbox, the important emails all that much anymore. Everything else goes to different categories. And I have found more and more, I just stopped looking at the categories. I'm like, eh, I don't really care. Unless I have to yeah. go search for it. It's allowing you to focus on the most important ones. Yeah. It is. And it's saving me over an hour a day. Yeah. And I was like, that's phenomenal. But the concept is I looked at something and I tried to figure out how to solve it as well as how to eliminate it. Because if we can just eliminate it, we don't need to solve it. And I think we waste a lot of time on things that are honestly irrelevant, right? Yeah. The first decision is, is it relevant? And, you know, you reclaimed an hour back, but you really reclaimed mental bandwidth. All that decision making over things that do not matter wear you down from being able to make decisions on what really matters in the business. And so it's both time, but also decision making bandwidth that we're reclaiming back as well. Plus no rabbit holes. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Remove the temptation. (laughs) Remove the, hey, hey, we all have it. So we're here to talk about how to have a more profitable business. You are a Profit First fan. How did you learn about it? You know, I do not remember how I heard about it, but I know that I listened to the audiobook. I'm sure it was probably hearing it on a podcast. I don't remember how I heard about it, but I certainly remember listening to the audiobook and then buying the book after that um, had completely changed my business. And As a business coach, I don't say this often, but I will say that this is the one decision outside of deciding to podcast that absolutely transformed my business, was was implementing Profit First. And I did that in about 2016, 2017. So you're a longtime adopter. Yes, yes. What changed once you implemented Well, we all like a good results story. So (laughs) I think that your listeners know the framework of Profit First. So I will share what happened the first year I practiced Profit First. The first year I practiced Profit First, I was excited to do my taxes. It wasn't something that I was like, oh my gosh, can we push it to the last minute? There wasn't anxiety about unknowns. It was like, man, I have all this money sitting in an account. I'm ready to pay it. Let's see what I owe. And I didn't owe as much as I saved. And I remember talking to my husband and I was like, yeah, so we've been talking about it. What if I could just write a check to pay off your truck? And that's what we did. That's what we did with the profits from the tax account after paying taxes because I was able to save so much more than was owed. And that was the beginning of the wins. Before you go on to the next win, I will tell you, This was a shocking one for me. How many business owners came to me and said to me, you know, at tax time, we're ready to pay our taxes. Like we're looking forward to, I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. And they're like, look, we hate paying taxes just like everybody. Let's do appropriate tax planning. We've done episodes on that. But it's the fact that they could just stroke a check. It was that confidence, that success, and knowing that. If there was extra money, it was bonus time for them, right? And you got to do what you wanted. And, you know, there's something to say, the mental preparedness of like, you already wrote that money off. Like, that's how it's truly a bonus. And that's why it doesn't hurt to write the amount you actually owe the IRS. You're writing it and you've already been writing it every time you did your distributions, like in your head. Okay, that's off. It's not even count, just out of the calculations. So yeah, that that really changed my well, the result made me, you know, okay, we're doing we're going to continue to do this. And then I just realized how beneficial it was and I just started sharing it with business owners because what flipped for me was thinking about my business because I started my business in 2012. And when we first start our businesses, it I think it's actually common, but there's a time where you have to keep reinvesting, right? You're going to take modest paycheck or modest draws and you're thinking, I've got to get my business to a certain point and that's going to take money. And when I read the book, I was like, why am I even doing this if I'm not taking a paycheck that makes sense for myself and my family? And it wasn't an either or, it was an and. How do I reinvest in my business and 
take a profit that makes sense for my personal goals. And it is not neither or. And if you're going to reinvest in your business, you expect a return on that reinvestment, which should be more profit. Absolutely. Or you can even loan your money to your business, your profit, and expect your business to pay you back on that with the increased reward to the business. And if the business can't pay the loan back, well, then you really didn't reinvest it, right? That's right. That's right. And that's what I ended up doing as well was being able to pay back my initial investment over the first five years. And it wasn't that I wasn't taking anything, but I think it was, you know, random draws. I wasn't even on payroll at that time. And I have since obviously changed to payroll plus draws, but it never felt as predictable. And that's also because I didn't have these accounts that were funded, right? And so the other psychological win is like, I have never again since worried about my paycheck. It actually feels even more secure than when I worked at corporate. They could have fired you at any time. And so once I started funding my owner's draw account and realized I was able to put a nest egg in and understand my business, it felt more secure and consistent that I knew that income was able to come into my household. You know, and I think this is an area people don't understand about profit first. You start funding your pay, your tax, your profit. Just because you fund it doesn't mean you need to take it. As a matter of fact, You set your payroll up, and if your payroll account continues to build above and beyond, you know, at some point you can think about a bonus, but what it really does is give you the ability to go, "Uh uh-oh, something went wrong for three months, but I still have enough money to pay myself. So my home life is secure. Now I can focus on my business and not be freaked out. As a matter of fact, I think you had that struggle, didn't you? Yeah. So in 2021, I uh, got COVID and I was really sick for two weeks. And then at the end of the two weeks, I ended up in the hospital and I was, you know, on breathing support. It was, it was really bad. I was in there for about 14 days. So now we're at a month being out of the business. And when I say out, I mean, I had to tell my husband how to get a hold of my team It was sudden and it was, I was completely off the radar. I was that sick. And followed by that, you know, I came home and I was on oxygen and I had rebuilt, you know, I had to rehab. I hadn't actually walked in a month. I had so many side effects, so many other things. That's not what this story is about. But what it's about is that whether it was COVID for me or unfortunately it could be cancer, a divorce, it could be a car accident. We are the lifeblood of the business as small business owners. And I needed to know. Well, actually, I didn't need to know. I knew and I didn't even worry about it. Like I did not worry about my business being there when I got back. I didn't worry about my team not getting paid. I didn't worry about things not being taken care of because I knew that my business could afford to pay the team that was still taking care of the business while I was gone. And, you know, we think that's going to happen someday, maybe, or some to somebody else. But when life, I call it, when life can punch you in the face, are you prepared? And of all the things I was worried about, I was worried about my life. I was worried about my health. I was worried about my family. They had actually got sick, but not as sick. I did not have to worry about my business. And I count my blessings that I was able to create a business that I felt so secure in And that we had the savings that I didn't come back to my business and have to get us out of a hole. Because that wouldn't have been a great place to come back to, right? So if I could come back and we were not in a hole, but I still needed to get the momentum back and going and back into the groove, financials weren't one of those stressors. And I grew up incredibly poor. I I grew up in a family where we worked really hard for our money and there wasn't a lot of luxuries. And I understood the stress that, that caused my parents. And so when I didn't have that financial stress, I was clear as day how grateful I was that that wasn't on top of everything else my family and I were going through. And, and I think that's a big part of it is the emotional side. Mm-hmm. And you can't put a price tag on that, nor is there a return on investment other than If you're emotionally strong, if your home life is taken care of, if your spouse isn't screaming because the kids don't have lunch money, (laughs) then it's easier for you to focus on your business. 
Yeah. And to be focused on what really matters, you can work off of your values instead of your bank balance. It allows you to make the decisions you truly want to make. And, and that is the power of profit first over time. Yeah. I mean, so my business, I have um, a team and they're all remote workers. They're moms. And I feel a huge responsibility. I wanted to ensure that my misfortune wasn't becoming their misfortune, whether that was that I couldn't pay them, their hours were cut, or maybe there wasn't a business to come back to. And so that is a value of mine. A value of mine is to run a profitable, healthy business, not just for myself, but for the team that I've created that got me here, that got the business here, that has supported me. I feel that that is my responsibility. And one way that I can live that responsibility out is through the strategy of profit first. The, the other thing that you mentioned that kind of made me think of that is in my world, when I'm teaching about time management and productivity, if you are completely stressed about finances, that trumps everything. Like if you're not having consistent income, consistent business, if you're dodging creditors and vendors, there's no room for leverage because you can't afford a team. That will trump anything else, which the anything else is choosing the journey of entrepreneurship. Like, how do you want this to feel? How do you want to experience this? What else do you want time for other than running your business? And it's really difficult to focus on those things if financials are your number one pain point. And I don't disagree with you. It, again, that comes back to emotions, right? When you have money, you can solve problems. The problem is too many people throw money at their problems and then they don't have money and they still have problems because they didn't actually fix the problem. They threw money at the problem, which well is not said. what we want to do. Right? <laughs> well so said. you help business owners to be more productive without necessarily throwing money at the problem. No, I, I focus on behavior and habits and strategies. It's not about, that's very well said. You know, I've had people come to me or I've had clients that were like, you know, if I can just hire an assistant, that will fix everything. And I was like, you, you realize that your chaos runs downhill, right? Like if you think you're going to hire an assistant that's going to manage up and organize you and teach you how to plan your days and teach you how to prioritize best use of your time, you're throwing money at it. And no matter how organized they are, they're going to feel like they're living in chaos. It's not going to last long. So that's a great example of people throwing money at trying to solve, quote unquote, productivity and time management issues with thinking someone else can come in and do this for them. Yeah. And you are correct. Like I always tell people, well, there's two areas that I do this. One is marketing and the other is in this area. You've got to build your systems and processes and then have somebody run your systems and processes, just like marketing. You've got to figure out why people are buying from you before before you invest in marketing, because it's very expensive to pay for someone else to figure out what your clients want, because they don't know. Yeah. And that's what happens, I mean, more often than not. How do you help with these behaviors and changing the way they do things? Yeah. So I do this through either private coaching or group coaching. Before starting my business, many years before starting my business, I was actually a business coach specifically in real estate on business systems and how to leverage through building a team and business systems. And that experience and what I drew out of that was they literally had the strategies handed to them on a silver platter, but there was a disconnect with implementing because they didn't have any time to work on their business. They were only working in their business. And so how I work with my clients is teaching them how to prioritize, how to create systems or to hire, leverage through better leadership, the things that it takes to run the business so that they have more time to work on the business. And there's a lot of different tweaks to that. It could be business systems need to be addressed. It could be their team. It could be their business model. If you have someone that's working straight in firefighter mode every day, like just putting out fires, how is there any time left to think about what's next for the business? Like how to think like a CEO, where are we going next? What's that next product? Because they can't get out of the today and right now. Um, so all of that is done through coaching and training. The reason I had said that actually is the gap between business coaching and then starting my business 
is that I went out to answer this pursuit, reading, listening, consuming as much information as I could around time management and productivity to answer one question. Is time management a skill set that can be learned? Because there's a lot of people out there that think, oh, that's their personality. They can do that. They have the gene. They're just naturally organized. And while there are some personalities that tend to lean to that, I believe that time management and productivity are a skill set and that they are not the same as being organized. So somewhere on my bookshelf is the 12-week year. Okay. which is how to get more done in 12 weeks than most people do in a year. Are you at all familiar with that book? I'm a bit familiar with it, yes. Okay. The reason I bring it up is that book and Profit First are both built on the same principle, which is Parkinson's Law. Yep. Right? You will use up all the time and money allocated. So we help them not allocate the money. You're helping them not allocate the time. Yeah. Right. To wasteful things. Yeah. So I actually talk and teach a lot about Parkinson's law. So in my world, and it does have to do with money too, but tasks expand to the amount of time given. And so Parkinson's law can work against you. And most of the times it does, but how do you make it work for you? And you can do that with time constraints of your schedule. You can do it with being very specific with what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, and for how long. You create these little buckets. We like buckets, right? Buckets of, mm -hmm. for the money and the distribution. But if you look at your calendar as these allocation buckets that need to be filled up with specific tasks or projects, now you're making Parkinson's Law work for you because you've put some constraints to it. Um, so I love talking about how that's working around us all the time, whether we know it or working against us all the time, whether we know it, and how we can make that work for us with some specific strategies. And that's what, for me, for time management, what I have found is certain things need time blocking. Certain things are things that need, like if I have a task that needs to be done in the future on a certain time frame or date or something, I find that if I just put it in a hole in my calendar, when that time comes, I just do it. Whereas before, when there was a hole in my calendar and there was nothing in the hole, I would spend 15 minutes trying to figure out what to do in the hole, and then the hole was done. That's right. That's right. And that brings up a good point that kind of closes a circle on the assistant thing. So can an assistant help with your schedule and help you plan your day? Yes. And what I work with my clients on is, what about that other element for the person that puts it on their calendar and doesn't do what they say they're going to do? the self-sabotage, the shiny object, the reprioritizing and negotiating with yourself right before you go into your high value activity like marketing. So part of it is strategy of like, well, what should my schedule look like and what should I actually be focusing on that moves the business forward? And we can know that part of the equation. But the other part is, how am I going to show up? Am I going to show up consistently? Am I going to honor and do what I said I was going to do? Am I going to shut off distractions and interruptions so that that block of time I gave is my best? I'm showing up my best and I'm showing up giving it my best. Those are the other softer side skills that I work on as well with my clients. Because if it was just about strategy, we could have all just read a book. We, we really do know about time blocking, right? We know about prioritizing. But how do you actually implement that on a consistent basis when there's a lot of variables and temptations all around us? I do hard things first. Good. <laughs> right? Like if it, if it requires thinking time or that kind of stuff, if it's done first, then I'm over it. Because if I try and do it last or later, A, you get behind, B, by the end of the day, I'm shutting down. So that's not really the time where I'm going to be productive in that space. And that's why I find if I block early and I do it early, then it's done and life is good. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I have a little tweak because I think we're all unique, right? Some people are going to say they're night owls and they get their wind in the evening where they can focus and the world just got quiet and that works for them. For me, I consider myself like a car that needs warming up. 
So if I'm going to start the day at eight o'clock, my first deep work isn't till 8.30 or nine o'clock. And I have a whole morning process that I go through that's clearing the slate, checking in with my team, processing my morning emails to quiet everything. And then I go into my deep work. If I were to just sit down at my desk and go into my deep work, I find it difficult to quiet all those open loops. And so I like to close them and then jump into it. So again, this actually goes to something else that I frequently say is that our goal is to show up our best, right? To do our best work. How we get there is unique to each of us. You're different than I am, different than someone else that's listening. And the conversation I don't think happens enough is that we say, hey, it's okay that you're different. Lean into that. What actually works for you to find your best time and to focus? My son needs his audiobook on all the time when he's studying. That would drive me nuts. I wouldn't be able to study anything. But for him, it's, it's been proven with science that that white noise, that background noise, is what slows his brain down so that he can focus on what's in front of him. So as oddly as I think that is, had I not understood that science and like what that was doing, I could have been a mom that's like, shut it down, do your homework, like go focus, right? Um, but the same thing is true for business owners. You know, what environment, what situation, what time of the day is going to set you up for success to do that high value, most important work? So what do you do when your employees aren't productive, meaning they don't deliver when they're supposed to on a consistent basis? There's a lot of reasons that could be happening. <laughs> The first place I like to look is at yourself. So as the business owner and as the leader, are you clearly communicating standards? Are you clearly communicating what is required of that task or project? And are you holding them accountable? And once you start checking some of those off, you know, sometimes we get to the end of the list and it really is. There's a skill set gap. There's a character flaw where they don't really want to give you their best work. They, they are not going to show up in the way that you need them to. But I really like to check off first because as business owners, we like to run. And communicating clearly sometimes slows us down. <laughs> so uh, I like to start there. Like, what is the way in which you're getting clear about what, what it is you need? what you're expecting, and then what's that cadence of accountability? And that's the one thing I like. I love traction because traction sets the meetings up. They're short meetings. You discuss the issues. Everyone makes agreement and you go. You don't sit around, just waste time. And you've got easy to understand metrics. It, you know, either you hit them or you don't. There's no like maybe or excuses or, right. or any of that. You've got something called Leverage Lab. What is that? Yeah. Leverage Lab is my group coaching and training program specifically for small business owners. And I work with them under the pillars of how to leverage themselves, which we talked a little bit about today, which is like mindset, work-life balance, like them as a person. Uh, the second one is time. So task management, time management, learning and creating to the the focus time to do their work. The third pillar is all about organization. So physical, digital, business systems. And the last pillar that we cover inside this program is leveraging through people, building your team in your business and outside of your business to leverage time everywhere. And those are, those are all skill sets. I mean, leverage, you know, it's funny. People look at leverage and they, they all think of financial leverage. They don't realize that there's multiple different types of leverage and that each one is unique. The difference is most leverage, unlike financial leverage, doesn't cut both ways. Like financial leverage, you can go into debt and get yourself in a lot of trouble, but most other levers don't have a negative to them. Other than if you don't set up a good system, your problems will multiply, but they'll multiply in proportion to how much more you're putting through the system. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why I created, I, that's why I named it Leverage Lab, right? So you're going to get a return on your time if you're organized, if you have business systems, if you understand how to manage your tasks and your projects and people as well. 
when we think about wanting to put a dollar in and get a dollar 25 out when we're investing, right? We want, le- we want to be able to do that. Well, where else can we do that with time? Then when we're training somebody, we're mentoring somebody, we're leading somebody, they're able to take things off of our plate. You're multiplying your time. There's not many other places where you're multiplying your time when you think of that as a high value activity is to invest in your team members. And then the lab part is because it's an experiment. In each of those pillars, we have to find out what works best for us. And while they're underlying principles and foundations, what I have found works is having it be a bit customized for each of us because it's not a one size fits all solution. We really have to take into account our personality, our strengths, our weaknesses. And I found using a couple of things. One is an automated calendar. So like for setting up appointments, even scheduling this podcast, you were sent a oh, link yeah. mm-hmm. and they click on the link and they find an appropriate time. And it, it's it's just, there's no back and forth. There's no, oh yeah, that was available, but now it's not. And it everything goes so, so much faster with that. And, and that has been helpful. And the other thing that I really find helpful is checklists. When you have checklists, Even if you're doing something over, like, let's take the podcast, right? There's a certain amount of stuff that has to go on in the podcast. If we have a checklist, you just follow the checklist. You don't think, you don't put mental energy into it. You just crank through it. Everything gets done. You don't have to double check it. Did I do that? Did I not? No, it's checked off. It's done. As long as you build good systems and processes, which take time, it all goes so, so much easier. And I, and I find for me, it's been super helpful. And then as part of that is removing steps. So like we're on a new platform now. We used to have to uh, record the podcast, upload it to the computer, then upload it to the cloud. Now I just tell my editor, we recorded, here's your sign in, go get it. Once, I never tell him again. It's Mm -hmm. just there. So I don't even have to communicate anymore. He can go into the system, see that there's new podcasts, download them himself, take care of everything. And so it has made everything go so, so much faster. Yeah. I mean, those are great examples of leveraging technology. Um, And then the opposite is something as simple as a checklist. We think it has to be all this technology and fancy, but it's as simple as a checklist will keep you on track make sure nothing falls through the cracks. And checklists are incredibly helpful for holding those standards and accountability I was talking about earlier, right? It's clarity about what is required. It's accountability. Did it get done? Did it not get done? Yeah. So I love that you gave kind of extremes of both because sometimes people get excited about productivity and time management and they're looking for the next program or the next technology that's going to fix the thing. And it's not always that, but there's definitely places that you can invest that will create efficiency, just like scheduling and calendaring. You know, it's funny because for the longest time, I was trying to figure out a way to create a system for me to do my weekly work, like prepping for clients. And we looked at Monday and we looked at all like all these different softwares that were out there. And it was driving me up the wall. Finally, I had a Monday expert come on and sit with me for an hour and show me how to do it all. And at the end of the conversation, I came to the simple conclusion. Building a simple online Excel sheet would solve my problem, would do it. And now it it is super easy to do. I have my checklist every week that's custom for the week because everything for the most part is pretty repetitive. And now my VA fills it out for me. So I don't even have to do it. So like, it's just there. And the best system is the one you'll use. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And there is something to be said about not over engineering the solution, right? (laughs) So for you, you didn't need a big project management system. And for others, Excel may not work the way and give all the benefits it needs. And it does need something else. And to your point, also, there is no perfect solution out there. (laughs) Even if you were to create your own perfect solution, it would be it would probably be great for you and one other person. Then everybody else would tell you how you should edit it and change it and update it, right? So you got to find the thing that fits your most important requirements and then use it. 
and I know we're getting ready to close out, but I'll also say this. Sometimes we use things and we want to go jump to another program, but we stopped reading the emails and going and watching the videos and the knowledge base. And we stopped learning about the program we already have, and we're not using all of its features. And then some new shiny object shows up in your inbox with great marketing and talks about these features. And long behold, if you looked at what you already were using, it has those features. You're just not using them. So before you go jumping ship, make sure you understand whatever you have with project or task management. Do you understand all the features? Do you need training with it? Do you need to commit some time to it? And that will be a better investment than starting over in another program. And I think that's, that is the big curve is learning how to use it and learning what it can and can't do and doing that before you invest all your time to make sure it's right for you. And I think that was for me going through all those systems, I realized they were too complicated for me and they wouldn't do what I wanted in a simple, easy way. And so I just went to the basics and I love it. Sometimes that's all you need to do. The term that I always, I like to use is what's the path of least resistance? And for you, opening a simple Excel sheet is path of least resistance. And when you, when you ask yourself that, that's usually the thing you're going to do. We're kind of lazy. Like, I mean, we think we want complicated, but if we can make something incredibly simple, we will be more consistent with doing it or using it. Here's the secret. Lazy people are the best because they figure out how to get it done with the least amount of effort. So <laughs> I love lazy because, you know, we just eliminate all the things that don't need to get done. There you go. If people would like to learn more about you or check out some of your programs, what's the best way for them to do that? Thanks for asking. Uh, you can find out everything over at amberdelagarza.com. Um, I also have a podcast called Small Business Straight Talk. So wherever you're listening to this, you can uh, search for Small Business Straight Talk. Thank you. And we'll put that in the show notes. Excellent. Thank you so much. This was a great conversation. And I, I wasn't expecting you to have so much interest in productivity and time management. So this was a great back and forth. I appreciate it. Hey, they are the foundation of more profit, right? I agree. Honestly, the businesses I love are the ones that require no effort and make lots of money. And so that comes down to building systems and processes and just being highly, highly efficient and letting the machine turn the money over to you. You got to love it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. How many success stories do you need to hear before you take action on Profit First? Look, you can implement Profit First on your own. Get the book from the library. Listen to the first bunch of episodes. You can read Clockwork or E-Myth or Traction and start working on productivity along with the 12-week year, which is based on the same principles as Profit First, Parkinson's Law. Once you get moving and you start getting traction and success, you decide. Do you want someone like us to help you speed up your success? Bring us on board. And remember, you don't need more resources. You need to be more resourceful or more productive. That's what it's all about. And don't forget, we focus on the bottom line. If you'd like for us to be a part of your profitability journey, we have different programs available ranging from do-it-yourself to one-on-one -on -one coaching. Our course, The Profit Blueprint, teaches you everything you need to know to transform your profitability. There are three different tiers, ranging from DIY to done with you, so that businesses of all sizes can get the support that's best. Join the waitlist in the show notes to get more information and be a part of the next cohort. If you want a done for you service, you can hire us as your chief profitability officers. We only work with a handful of clients, so they all get our full attention. We work with business owners who have or are growing to half a million to 10 million in revenue. You can use the scheduling link in the show notes to get on our calendar for a good fit conversation to see if we're the right people to support you and how we can help you. Remember to check out my other podcast, Richer Soul, where we talk about how to live the ultimate life and be the best business owner you can be. As we close out, let's repeat the mantra. Revenue is vanity. Profit is sanity and cash is king. Have an abundant and profitable week.